The summer is heating up on Wrestling Insiders Wednesday, July 29th. After WWE, NXT, and AEW go off the air, former WWE Intercontinental and Tag Team Champion Marty Jannetty debuts live on Wrestling Insiders with a cyber autograph signing where you can meet and greet with the future Hall of Famer from anywhere in the world. Then Sunday night, August 2nd, Wrestling Insiders is back at your house in Auburn, Maine on the front porch of WWE Hall of Famer Mr. USA Tony Atlas taping a special live program with a cyber autograph signing and meet and greet. Help keep professional wrestling legends working. Support these great programs and online autograph sessions you can watch in our archives again and again. Visit bostonwrestling.com and our social media platforms for complete information. This is Harley Race. This is Shelton Benjamin. This is Mr. Wonderful Paul Lorndorf. This is the Monster Abyss. And this is Daniel Bryan. This is JBL, and you're watching the MWF. Be there live. Wrestling fans around the corner, around the world. I'm Dan Marotti, along with Mr. USA WWE Hall of Famer Tony Atlas. Well, welcome to another episode of Wrestling Inside is at your house, or maybe Atlas your house. Here we are again, up in beautiful downtown Auburn, Maine, at Atlas yes. Estates. Yes, now y'all come to visit Maine. We got plenty of things here to do. We even got six buildings. Six what? Buildings downtown. Buildings? Yeah, downtown. Oh, right. we got six of them. Oh, we saw a Dairy Queen. That was looking pretty oh, good here in the summer heat. Oh, we got a Dairy Queen too, y'all. All right. Well, Tony, uh, fans have wanted to know. We had requests from literally coast to coast on this one. Your memories of the late, great Mr. Wrestling too. Oh, my goodness. Man, you get to know quite well. Very well. A fellow baby face at times. Well, Wrestling 2... Tell the fans Mr. who he even was before we get Mr. going. Mr. Wrestling this. number an two. Old time, huh? Mr. Wrestling number two. He started his career at Johnny Rubberman Walker. The reason they call him that because he what you call double joint. I mean, you could twist his arm all the way around. You could twist his joint. You could tie him in a knot. He was very, very flexible. Like someone else we know. So what they was trying to do, they had another wrestler called Mr. Wrestling number one, which was Tim Wood. And they wanted to bring in another mask guy to fight Tim Woods. And this mask guy dressed similar to Tim Woods. Tim Woods, if you look at him on the mask, Mr. Wrestling, he wore all white. White mask, white boots, everything was white. So they created this other character that had a white mask with a black face and the trunk was trimming black. So he was in black and white, Tim Woods in all white. When Tim Woods in older day old time wrestlers to show how tough they were, they would invite people out of the audience to wrestle them. So Tim Wood had to do this exhibition with a wrestling fan. And by accident, Tim Wood's mask came off. As the guy was getting out of the ring, he reached up and pulled Tim Wood's mask off. When Tim Wood tried to grab the guy, to keep him from running away from the mask, his finger went inside the guy's mouth. The guy bit down on the finger and bit his finger off. Now you got your top wrestler Stand in the ring, unmasked and bleeding from a wrestling fan. Which, at that time, Mr. Wrestling number two was there to, as you say, lose or put Mr. Wrestling over. So they had to reverse the whole concept. So instead of pushing Mr. Wrestling one, they had to push Wrestling two because Wrestling one got destroyed by a wrestling fan. So they sent him out the territory for a while let him float around here, float around there to bring back. But by that time, they built up Mr. Rats 2. I was Georgia Tag Team Champion with Mr. Wrestling 2. I traveled with him uh, a great deal. I learned a lot about Mr. Rats 2. I remember one time I asked Wrestling 2, I said, will you uh, watch my match and tell me what I do wrong? He said, on one condition, whatever I tell you, you don't get mad about it. He said nobody in any business could become successful if they're not able to take constructive criticism. He said if you're able to take constructive criticism, I would help you in your match. 
He said, also, you will become successful. And that's the thing that I learned from wrestling too, to be able to take constructive criticism. He wrestled all over, all over Georgia for, for many, many years. Mm -hmm. And was a big, big draw. He tag teamed, he was held championship with you know, Tommy Rich, Walter, Dusty Rose. I mean, he wrestled with some of the great, and against some of the great. He wrestled against the great Harley Race, wrestled with Ric Flair. And it's a shame that more people don't know him because to me, he was one of the greatest wrestlers that the world ever knew. He was that and good. He was very good. And the thing about wrestling too, he never got a break until he was an older man. Much older man. He was much older. He was, when he got his break, he was probably 40 years he old. Older. He was getting ready to retire. He bought a gas station in Tennessee. Yeah, yeah. And then he got that break. And he made, he made a break. But, but, but he told me it took him 30 years to get a break. Yeah. 30 years. He waited to, to get that one break, and he got it by accident. Mm -hmm. if, if he would have his career would have never got started if it hadn't been for uh, 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 the, that that incident with Mr. Wrestling and Tim Wood. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so so I'm, I'm gonna miss him. Uh, I saw him probably about ten years ago. They, they used to have a convention down in Charlotte, North Carolina. The NWA legend. The NWA legend, and and, and he he come there from Hawaii. And believe it or not, he almost died 10 years ago. He had a heart attack. There, I think, right? Yeah, right yeah. there. Sure did. Sure did. Had a heart attack there. And they had to keep him. The next day, everybody flew home. He couldn't fly home. They had to put him in the hospital. He got hospitalized there. Uh, saved the hospital about a couple of weeks before he wow. went back home. So, before it was so, safe to fly, yeah. Yeah, it was safe. They, they would put him on a plane, you know. So so he was he, he was quite, a, quite a, a, a friend. Now, is it true that he really didn't like to take that mask off anywhere? He showered with it? Um, Nobody in them days did. Well, not, even, not just him. Wrestling too went to the White House to see President Jimmy Carter. They wore the mask. Caused issues with the Secret Service. Yeah, yeah. But 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 he didn't take a mask off. Wrestling too would wear his mask all the time. When he showered. Yeah. Even when he went to see the rats, I was told that he used yeah, to keep, yeah, the he kept the mask on. They were worried that and you know they, who else done that was Bill Mascara. He kept the mask they, on with rats. When they all did, yeah. that was that was it. That was their money. See the idea of a mask man? You don't know who it is. Once you take it off, that's it. That's it. They were that's his draw. That's his draw. As long as he keep that mask on, he gonna make himself and the promoter money. Once that mask comes off, he's done. That's, that, that was his livelihood. So he waited 30 years for that break. Now, if you wait 30 years for something, you're not going to mess it up in a few minutes. Right. Unless you're stupid. Right. And he was not a stupid man. So that's why he kept him at Bill Masquerade was like that too. You got people right now today that wrestled with Bill Masquerade for years. And if Bill Masquerade walked up to him, they wouldn't know who the they hell would know him on the street, right? They wouldn't know. Now, was it widely known back in those days that he was uh, a registered sex offender in Hawaii from when he was in the military? Yeah, I didn't know that. Oh, he was, yeah. Him and a bunch of the military guys went to town on a youngin in Hawaii, well before he got into wrestling. Well, that doesn't surprise me because I tell you the reason why. Johnny liked him young? No, no. I tell you the reason why. Like I said, I can tell some stories. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's tell some Johnny Walker stories. Olivia's well, passed. Wait, wait, wait. He never, I, I didn't know that about it. But, yeah. but what I'm saying, in the wrestling days, all of us have been registered sex offenders. Every wrestler that was in the 70s would have ended up being one. Every wrestler in the 70s. Every damn one Every of one of them. Every damn one of them. I, I want me to say it again. Every damn one of them. That's how the world was. Everybody was sexual predators in the 70s. Everybody would have been a sex offender in the 70s. Everybody. I don't think I can make any of the than I did. Everybody. 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 That was the world then. We keep forgetting the world that we live in now was not the world these guys lived in. Women's had no rights. There was a story that went, wasn't wrestling where the women got raped in a biker club, took them to court. They said she enticed them. Remember that stuff? No. But enticed I'm them. I'm sure it's a true story. Right. That, it was all over the news. They enticed her. They ran a train on the gangbanger. 
But they walk She enticed away. everyone, apparently. Yeah, because she wore shorts. Yeah. She had a miniskirt on. These were some of the excuses that rapists used in the 70s to violate women. What she she had a short skirt on. Oh, wait, you could rape her then. I mean, so that's why we talk about these things earlier about the women's and stuff. Women are just now being able to talk about it and being taken seriously. Given respect. Respectful. Unless you was a nun in a church, nobody believed your claim. Even today. Even today. You see it now on TV. Girl come up with sexual harassment. Well, sure, we believe the girl or shoot me. We do it today to women. So it's, it don't surprise me that some guy 50 years ago assaulted a woman and got away with her. They're doing it today. Nothing changed. The only thing changed is that certain corporations that don't tolerate, like the WWE, is not going to tolerate that. Right. But if Stephanie McMahon was not in charge, I think they would tolerate it. You think they would? Of course. Really? Of course. Well, I know, Tony, in your younger days, you used to wear a robe sometimes. Yeah. Did Olivia Mr. Wrestling, Mr. Wrestling, uh, uh, two wife made it. For Olivia me. Walker, she yeah, made she, you a robe? Yeah, she made me three of them. One was red and black, one was dark blue and light blue, and another one was yellow and black. Now, where were your robes? I wish I had kept them. You don't have them anymore? No. no. What'd you do with them? Do you remember? I, don't, I, would, I couldn't tell you. If I could do it, yeah. I've so, seen a photo of you in the blue one. I, I know. I got one upstairs of me and Ivy Puskett. I got the blue robe on. She made a, a substantial amount of money making the robes yeah. for guys like I got Rick Flair, and Greg Flair, Valentine. And, and you watched me wrestling Hulk Hogan, I came in with the black and yellow one. You had a robe as a baby face in WWF? It's on, it's on the internet. Yeah, look it up. Hulk Hogan versus Tony Atlas. In the first match. You come out in the robe? Yeah, it's I the didn't first remember match. that. You never saw me wrestle no. Hogan? No. It's the very first match on YouTube. When you go to Tony Atlas, Oh, Tony, a microphone fell off. Yeah, you You're getting a little too animated, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah you go to Tony Atlas. Yeah. And, and you go to video. Yeah. It's the first video. I come in the rain. Yeah. Well, he's See? looking at it he right now right on YouTube, YouTube, apparently. It's very easy. It's the first match. First match on YouTube. You just never watch my matches on YouTube. I guess I haven't watched them all. It's the first one. It's the first match the that comes up. The very first one. If you put Tony Atlas in YouTube, that's the first thing that comes up? The Hogan and Atlas match. Wow, I didn't know that. It's the first match on when you hit video. And everything else followed that. Because to, to the fan, that, that one and me and Rock and Ring the Belt are the two greatest matches. But but it's hard to find me and Rock and stuff. There's very little bit on me and Rock in yeah. there. You ever notice that? I Well, we've talked about that several times. <laughs> very yeah. little. Yeah. Very little on me and Rock. First world champion. <laughs> like SD said, y'all the first guy that put that belt on it they didn't use it. Yeah. They do nothing with her. They did the same in the wrong so made him champion. What they do with him? So he didn't have a very long run. He didn't do nothing. Yeah. He didn't wrestle nobody. The whole time, Sting was still the champion. Sting was still the main event. To the fans, yeah. No, to the promotion. The fans had nothing to be, got nothing to do with who being that main event. That's the promotion. Ron Simmons wasn't in the main event squad as champion. Not when Sting was on the card. Sting was always put in a bigger position. Yes. Yes. Well, it was a short run. There really isn't much to Yes. To with, with why? They, what they did with it. Do you think it was wise to put the belt on Ron? Well, see, Bill Watts put it on it, but then he was getting a lot of heat. So he couldn't push Ron the way he wanted to. They, you know, they kicked him out of the NWA for that. Who? Cool. Uh, Bill Watts. Well, I don't understand how a guy that hired the first black booker lit New Orleans on fire with Junkyard Dog, and then made Ron Simmons the first black world champion, could be labeled one of the worst racists in the history of professional he was. wrestling. You think he was? No, he told me. Bill? Yeah, he told me. He what did he, he say? He said, he said, I was the most radical, racist person you ever want to meet. Until he met Ernie. Ernie Ladd. Yeah. He told me that himself, yeah. Do you think he deserved to lose a job in 1993 because of it? No. I don't either. No. I don't, think anybody, I don't think anybody that could do their job should lose their job because of personal feelings. See, we, the man changed. He wasn't doing it. He did more to help black wrestlers than to hurt them. I think so. Just like George Waters became one of, he was a Klansman, became one of the hated people in America by about? black George Wallace, governor George oh, okay, Wallace. Okay. But then towards his death, he was the most beloved person in America by blacks. People could change. You can't hope, I hope nobody 
will hold my paths against me. He who is without sin cast the first, first stone. Me and Satan was running, buddy. Satan used to come to me and ask for trick tips. I used to give the devil advice. I was just that bad. Now, what years are you talking about there? From 1988 to about 90. For two years? Yeah, I was, I was on crack. I was doing everything. Couldn't nobody control me. Didn't nobody want to use me. Yeah, I mean, the devil used to come and knock on my door. Hey, Tony, you got any advice for me to, to do? I was, I was worse than Satan himself. And what made you time. turn the corner? Living under the bench? Well, no, that, that, that most definite. And my wife monitor. And I turned, and I remember a Gary Capote. He was on a show one time, and he heard I was in the dress room. And he refused to go in the dress room. And they said, why you don't want to go in there to see Tony? He said, he's the most obnoxious person I've met in my life. People was afraid of me. Now, who is this? Uh, Gary Capetta. Oh, the ring announcer. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, he, really? he, he, and and Pomoda had to convince him that Tony have changed. He's a very nice guy. When you tell people now that Tony's a nice guy, people that knew me in the 80s go, you talking about Tony Atlas? I was a mean motherfucker. I, I never knew that, sir. I would knock your freaking head off of you in a heartbeat. Everybody was afraid of me, man. And you think it was the drugs that made you? No, I wasn't on drugs then. But what was the problem? The problem was I couldn't be whooped physically. And you had an ego. I've, I've been in over 100 fights. I never lost. See, I got a very high tolerance to pain. As we've seen. Right. So when you hit me, it don't have the same effect. Well, maybe now I'm an old man now. But when I was younger... People used to punch me, and I just keep coming to them. And I was incredibly strong, you know. You couldn't hurt me. Let's put it that way. So I could hurt you, but you couldn't hurt me. Mm -hmm. So people was afraid of me. A lot of wrestlers was afraid of me. They, they wouldn't fight me. I told you story about Bundy, a lot of guys. They said, I ain't fighting fucking Tony Atlas. Eventually, you try to get guys to stretch me in the ring. Really? Yeah. Like who? And a lot of guys used to do that. Not just, not, 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 not just. Uh, uh, Vince by himself. All the old timers, they had their henchmen and stuff. You know, it wasn't just Vince. I, I shouldn't say Vince, but a lot of guys would do that and say, "Hey, go in there, and, you know, don't sell for them or don't don't do this for them." Well, when they did that to me, I just threw them around. They told Paul Ondorf, "Don't sell for me." The match is on that. They told Randy Savage not to sell for me. Well, that's when you, you picked him up and dropped him on the turnbuckle, right? Oh yeah, yeah. like he was a baby. I got treated him like a baby now. I let you know, if you don't sell for me, I don't sell for you. <laughs> I couldn't nobody beat me. That was my problem. Never lost a fight in my life. And been in over a hundred fights and never wow. lost. Because I got a very high tolerance to pain. What makes someone have a high tolerance for pain like that? Just the way they're born? I used to get beaten up a lot when I was a kid. So you think you built up a resistance to it right. almost? Yeah. I used wow. to fight a lot when I was a kid. I remember when I was 12 years old, my dad said, boy, we're going to make some money. I go, okay. Come out, I'm going to show you something. And he used to tell me to hit him right here. Your father? Yeah, hit him right here. Hit him right here. And he showed me how to hit. See, when you hit, you hit like this. That won't bust a grape. When I hit, when I hit, I hit like, like, like this. What you know? What What's I'm doing? You're not turning the fist. No. What I'm doing? Turning into it? I'm using all of this. Oh, using the upper torso. Uh, oh, you're not just using the arm. Uh, I put my weight. I learned how to put my weight behind every punch. See, when a person throw a punch like this, it's just this. It's the arm. That's right. But 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 did I, did I, if I hit you here, see here? Yeah. You in look my like arm a boxer move? almost. Yeah. See. That's how you hit them. So you knock the shit out right. of them. It's, it's so like, let's say you here, and I catch you, and this is it. See, keep see I made contact here. But by the time I finish the punch... You're still going. And they're on the floor. So who, they, your dad taught you that? Mm -hmm. Wow. This is why. Then he said, oh, yeah, you ready now. You ready now. We had a corner in Lomo, Virginia, called Scrapper's mm -hmm. Corner. 
And he would sit there and play dice with the people that worked for the railroad, the North and rest of the railroad. And they sat there and be drinking their whiskey. Everybody back in the day would go buy a fifth of liquor, keep it in their back pocket. Mm -hmm. So my dad would watch him. When you see somebody finish that fifth, he said, hey, you want to make a bet? And I was tall and skinny. I was, when I was 12, I was 6'2". I weighed 138 pounds, 140 pounds. Mm -hmm. And he said, I bet you, you can't beat my boy over there. That young skinny punk, I don't want to hurt your boy noise. You can't beat my boy. Then my dad, they would make a bet. He come to me and said, look, if you lose this fight, you're going to get a worse whooping when you get home. So I had to fight this man. Most time these guys was in their twenties and thirties. Mm -hmm. I was twelve. Wow. When I was twelve, I was fighting thirty year old men. Wow. When I was twelve, twelve, thirteen. All my brothers here. My dad taught us how to hit a man. He said when you hit a man and he don't go down, I want you to walk around behind him and see what's holding him up. Yeah. See most people hit you here, they they face shot. Yeah, I cut them right here. Right on the jaw? All right, right here. Right on the jaw. Cut them right here. Out like a light. Out like a light. But you got to put some weight behind it now. That's why a fighter, you know the first thing I would look at somebody before I fight them? Their neck. Why the neck? The neck, the head weighs around 15 pounds, the head. The neck support the head. It's a foundation. So when I hit that head, you got a weak neck. Look like a bobblehead. You're going to bobblehead me. People don't know that. You wouldn't go for the throat, though. That's why me at my age, look at my neck. You still got a strong neck. Not as big as it used to be. No. But not weak. Still big. Still big. But thin. not weak. No? Oh, I, no. Yeah, but I fight somebody, the first thing I do is look at their neck. They got a little piercing neck. Like Freddie Blass said, piercing neck geek. Come with your, with your neck, I can control your equilibrium. I get you a front face lock, I break your freaking neck. Yeah. If you got a weak neck, that what happened with that guy when they killed him. That's why that's why these guys died when they put that knee on their neck. Oh, oh. they got they weak neck. neck they got yeah. weak necks. The head weighs 15 pounds. The head it is important. So that neck they're trying to support that 15 pound head plus that 200 pound man. Ain't it going to happen. Yeah. The neck. Most people in cocks neck is called a whiplash because they get hit from the hand and the neck bounces around. And I get what's called a whoop lap. In it, great athlete, you can always tell a, a, a great competitor by the his neck. Remember the Aaron Sheep neck? Yes, very thick neck. Because he was a shooter. Yeah. Quas Vizieri. He was a shooter. You ever know you could tell a worker from a shooter? That's right. Look at Brock Lester neck. Yeah. Look at Randy, Randy Orton don't, don't have a good neck. No. But look at the neck. You could tell the shooter. By the neck. A real shooter got a good neck. A real fighter got a good neck. A real wrestler got a good neck. Anybody that do contact have a strong neck. You have to. This is where all the action is at. You know? You take any wrestler, even amateur, where they grab you? By the neck. By neck. And that neck is very, very important. So, so I would look at, my dad would look at a guy's neck. He said, oh, you could knock him out. There's nothing stopping the head from moving. Or spinning around. It's just like this house. If I weaken that foundation, this whole house fall down. You got a weak neck. You can't. You can't That's take. It. You can't take much, much punishment above that neck. Then you got a sternum right here. Mm -hmm. Right here. Like if I'm gonna punch you in the stomach, if you go punch a person in the stomach, where where will you punch them at? Point to yourself. Point to your stomach. I'd probably probably right in here. A about little bit higher. A third of the way up? About a, little, a little lower right there. That's the stomach. Why right there? That's where the stomach at. That's what you should aim for. The this is your intestines. This is your intestines. That's no good. Hey, your stomach. Right you lose there. your lunch. If you hit it right here, they'll lose uh -huh. the lunch. Or you hit them in the kidneys, they pee on themselves. Yo, you and you Even if you can't beat them, them, you hit them right in the kidneys. It's hardly a kid. They, they, they can't help it. They would piss all over themselves. The fight is over. They'd be humiliated. You want with piss running out your leg? You want to stand out there? Everybody gonna laugh at you. You gonna leave? 
See, it ain't it ain't well, what it ain't what you do. It's just know where to hit the. Do it, yeah. It's how you do it. You know, if, if you got to learn where to hit a person. See, most people when they swing, they swing it. They swing it. There's no power to nothing. That's why I was able to walk into that shit. They're not delivering. But if somebody boom, boom, I'm leaving him alone. You know somebody what to come look for here. In a fighter, yeah. See here. I'm leaving him alone. I can tell if you go arm wrestling by the way you put your arms up. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Were you a successful arm wrestler? In State time? champion. Where? Virginia. Virginia. Yeah. Really? At yeah. what age? About fifteen. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, and I learned all these things. I can tell if a person could could fight by the way he stands. Yeah. Just by the way you place yourself, I can tell you can fight. You know him. how to eye them. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. Because it's a certain way people that know what they're doing do. That when I'm in the ring, the first the first minute, I know what type of match. That's why I never talk the match over with these guys. That's why old timers never do that, because you don't know if this guy could perform that or not. So what I do sometimes the first match I have with somebody is normally my worst match. Then I get him back in the dressing room. I tell him what he did wrong, or if he did a good job with. Whoa, whoa! If he hey. if he did a good job, if he did a good job. Andre over there, yeah. Yeah, if he did a good job with a very simple match, uh -huh. you know what I would tell this what kid? What would you tell him? I said, the next time we work together, kid, if you got any ideas, let me know. I would let him implement ideas. Yeah. But first, I got to take him in the ring to see if he know what the hell he's doing. Right. I'm not going to know what you're working Yeah, some guy come to me, some young kid I know, met in my life, talking about, hey, you want to do this? We're going to do this. And I'm sitting there like an idiot. Okay. <laughs> and then I get out there, and they said, you take me out on a stretcher. That's my stupidity. Right. You know, it's like a car. Before you buy, you do what? Check test drive. Test driver. That's what I do in the ring. I test drive. Like that kid I worked with last time. I told him. Vicente I said, Ray Wasp. Yeah, I, I told him. And I said, if Dan ever book us again, I said, I will let you do more. Him and his breast. Yeah. I told him that. Because he, he did a good, he did a he nice supper. Him. Well, he did a nice supper match. He listened well good. And we left the ring and nobody got hurt. So now I feel more confident to him where I would allow him to do some of his stuff. And once I allowed my opponent to do more of his stuff, my match would become more excited. See, at first I do everything in a match that is safe for me right. and him. Safety is my number one it has priority. To be. At the first time around, I got to get comfortable enough where I would feel safe with you to really do a good match with you. Mm -hmm. And that's how all the old timers were. They would, they, you just got to test the water before you dive in, you know? And that's what I do, and that's how come I went so many years in this business without getting hurt. Because I'm not going to, my job is to protect my opponent's body. His job is to protect my body. So I know I can protect his body, but I don't know if he can protect mine. You got to be safe. And right, I got to make sure I feel safe enough to allow this guy to slam me, to backdrop me, to do things to me, because I have had accidents where guys didn't know what they were doing. I have had that before. So, I don't, you know, fool me once, shame on, on uh, you. Fool me twice, shame on me, because I knew. You got it. I, I knew. I knew. I knew. All right, wrestling fans, you're in it from the Hall of Famer himself. If you have any great Mr. Wrestling True memories, share your thoughts in the comment section below. As always, if you want to help keep great wrestlings like Tony Atlas work, and head on over to that Patreon, baby. Dozens of studio shoot interview DVDs plus early ad-free full-screen access to Wrestling Insiders. Patreon.com backslash Boston Wrestling. The Hoff is available as he's bored for personal appearances, personal phone calls, personal drawings, tons of great merchandise over on eBay. For the Hall of Famer himself, Mr. USA Tony Atlas, I am Dan Marotti. Until we speak again, folks, you and yours be well.